you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Well, good afternoon. Um, I don't know if this if, if this microphone is active. I don't. You can all hear me, all right. Okay. Um, I've been having a little uh, congestion, and my voice is is not. Uh, what it ordinarily is, I think, but I'm, I'm sure you can all hear me. I will project. Um, it's a great privilege to be here. I always love uh, talking to people at St. John's, and I have spoken here, as Mike said, a number of times, and uh, I feel that I'm a, a real member of this community. I'm very proud of St. John's, and uh, it's a great honor to be associated with it. Um, I don't know what I'm going to say to this afternoon, but I will think of something. <laughs> I, did, I did bring some things to read, and I will maybe pick and choose among them. Um, <clears throat> but since we are here on the 31st of October, um, I, th I think it uh, is appropriate that I should wish you all a happy Halloween. And I'm sorry to see that very few of you are in costume. Uh, uh, and it is, uh, it is another, uh, it is also important that we are about to um, elect some people to office. And I, so I wanted to announce at the outset that if nominated, I will not serve. And if, if elected, I will not uh, know. How does that go? If nominated, I will not run. And if elected, I will not serve. <laughs> Having got that out of the way. Billy the Kid, yes, all right. I can tell a story about Billy the Kid. Billy the Kid uh, and I are old friends. Uh, we rode the range together. You know, you can't grow up in New Mexico as I did without having some knowledge of Billy the Kid. And uh, I have spent a good deal of time reading about him and uh, uh, in as much as he is a, a friend of mine, I, I know quite a bit about him, if I do say so myself. And I think that he should be pardoned. Um, Billy, Billy the Kid was a, uh, a boy, as you know. He didn't live to be very old. He must have been in his early 20s when he was killed. And um, <clears throat> I think the more I know about him, the more convinced I become that he was simply a, a boy who was uh, uh, looking for a home. His, uh, his, he, he was orphaned at a, at a fairly young age. And um, he spent the rest of his life uh, wandering around on the outside of the law, unfortunately. And that did him in, finally. He was, uh, he, there was a price put on his head. As you all know, I'm not telling you anything new. But um, I, have, I have some sympathy for him. Uh, and I think he's been greatly misunderstood by history. And uh, we need to know more of the actual facts of his life. Um, Billy and I were riding down from in the Hondo Valley one evening. We'd been riding a long time, and uh, we were tired, bone tired. And we saw the lights of a little village down below, and I believe the name of the village was, uh, um, uh, Arroyo Seco, something like that, I've forgotten exactly. But we headed down into the village because we wanted rest and, and food and drink. And we found a little cantina that was open, and uh, we went in, and as, as we say in the West, bellied up to the bar. And as we were standing there uh, quaffing our thirst, um, a man who was very drunk, intoxicated, came and stepped in between us. And he was obnoxious. He was obnoxious. He kept trying to talk to us. and. Uh, we were so tired, and we recognized that he was not able to talk very well anyway, so we were trying to avoid him, but he would not allow us to do that. And uh, so um, he, uh, he, he, he just uh, was there, and, and uh, he kept talking to Billy, 
trying to engage Billy in conversation, and he said, he said, move over, move over, friend. And he just nudged in between us and sort of uh, touched uh, Billy's shoulder, which was a mistake. And, and uh, I, I just looked at him, and I could see Billy over the, the drunk's shoulder. And I shuddered because I knew that this man was, you know, he was, doom was about to fall on him and he didn't know it. But Billy was capable of great restraint and he understood the man's condition and did not want to take advantage of him. But he looked at him. He looked into the man's eyes and he looked in such a way that the man simply withered and withdrew never to be seen again. And, you know, it was at that moment that I realized that Billy the Kid was the only, only person I've ever known in whose eyes there was no expression whatsoever. Well, that's the story. I have many stories about Billy, but, but that one is, uh, that will suffice on Halloween, right? Um, and in as much as it is Halloween, I want to tell you about witches, witches I have known. When I was 12 years old, uh, my parents and I moved to Jemez Pueblo, where they became the teachers of the day school there. And they, they taught there for 25 years and retired. And um, I spent my most um, impressionable years at Jemez. And Jemez is an interesting community. Uh, and there are witches there. I heard about them, you know, when I was uh, when I first went there. I, oh yeah, witches! There are witches around, and I thought, sure, there are. <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 witches. I don't believe in witches. And then one evening, uh, after we had lived there for a time, um, the children had gone home from the day school. And my parents and I lived in a teacherage which adjoined the classrooms of the, of the school. And uh, my mother and I were in the, in the living room of the teacherage. When some of the children came running up to the door, and it was just about dusk. The light was failing fast. It was getting dark. And the children were very excited, very excited. And they said, Miss Mama, did Miss Mama, come, witches, witches. And so, you know, we, of course, we went out to see what they, what, what, uh, what they were talking about. They were so excited. And there was a dirt road which ran from Hamas down to San Isidro, a village about five miles away. And they led us out into that road, and they pointed down the road. And in the distance, as it was growing dark, there were lights moving across the road, maybe, maybe a quarter of a mile away. And it looked to me as if some people were down there with flashlights moving back and forth across the road. And um, the children said, witches, witches, those are witches. And I, you know, thought, oh, you poor kids, you've been so deluded. The, those are people down there with flashlights. And um, just as I had that unholy thought, one of the lights moved right across the top of the world. And from that moment, I believed in witches at Hamas. And on another occasion, um, in, the, in the teacherage one night, uh, I was in the kitchen. And the kitchen windows overlooked a road that ran out to, uh, beside the school, ran down to the river and into the Pueblo. And uh, I looked out and I saw men running. These were men in white ceremonial trousers, headbands, and they were running silently. You know, I just saw them through the window go passing by, as if in slow motion. And it was like a Kurosawa movie. They were bunched and they were running. And I didn't know why, but I found out that they were running after witches. They were on a witch hunt. So things like that, you know, just wonderful spurs to the imagination when you're a boy and you see something of that kind and, 
and the gravity of it uh, grabs you after a while, and uh, you, you understand that you've seen something that, uh, you know, you don't often see. It means something to you. It builds, builds up your, uh, your imagination and creativity in a way. So I'll tell you another story about Hamas. Because this is a conversation with Scott Mamaday, right? And I can be as personal as I want. I can just go here and there and do whatever. I'm, and you're a captive audience, and so <laughs> I'm taking advantage of you. But it is, uh, it, is, uh, it is about to be November. And the great feast day at Hamas is on November 12th, Feast of San Diego. And um, on the 1st September that I was there, um, I was 12 years old, as I, as I say, and uh, I had no idea what was happening. But on the morning of the 11th, November 11th, I heard this commotion outside the teacherage again. And, and um, so I went out to see what was going on. And um, on that same road, the road down to San Isidro, I looked down that road and there were covered wagons as far as I could see. It was a caravan that uh, I'll never forget. And these were the Navajos coming in from Torreon. And they were decked out in their finery, velveteen blouses and silver galore, turquoise, covered wagons, men on horseback, the dogs under the wagons. It was, it was like a Renaissance fair. And uh, I watched, I watched. And in November, you know, at Hamas, uh, it's generally cold and there were snowflakes in the air and all that color. It was just wonderful. And um, I will never forget that. Never to be seen again. And as a matter of fact, the next year, there were fewer covered wagons and there were a couple of pickups in the caravan. And then in another year, fewer covered wagons still. And in three or four years, no covered wagons. And I realized that I had come upon something at the right moment. And uh, I will always be very grateful for having been there at that time. It was perfect timing, and and it left a memory in my in my brain that uh, I'll live with for the rest of my life, and be grateful for having seen that. It's a great place. So on the twelfth, if you have if you have a free day, uh, wander over to Hamas. It's a great occasion. It's crowded, a lot of congestion. It's hard to find a parking place now. But the dance is very colorful, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. To it, uh, I, I'm teaching a class down at UNM, and uh, it's a course in oral tradition. And I was, I was uh, giving my students some examples of uh, Pueblo prayers and Navajo prayers, and so. On. And I said, "Oh, by the way, on the 12th of November, um, there's this feast day at Hamas, and." You know, you're, you're close enough if you get a carpool together. Uh, you can go and have a wonderful time feasting at Hamas on the 12th of November. And it happens that I meet the class at UNM on Wednesday. And November the 12th falls on a Wednesday. And so the other day when I was talking to my students, one of them said, It's on a Wednesday, Dr. Mamaday, isn't it? Yeah. Can we have the day off? <laughs> Only if you go to the feast at Hamas, I said. So, so I expect to see some of them there. Well, uh, I want to, I want to, uh, Mike, am I going to have about 45 minutes or so? And then can I, uh, will there be some questions? Yeah. Okay, great. I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, I am writing, um, I, I am a writer, and uh, I am presently working on a memoir. In 1976, I published a book called The Names, which is an autobiographical narrative, and I wrote about the first 17 years of my life. Much of it centered on Hamas, by the way. But more recently, I have decided that uh, it's time for me to, to uh, write something about my life after the age of 17. And so I'm writing about things that have happened uh, since then, places I've been and things I have done and people I've known and so on. Um, so that book was entitled The Names. And what I'm thinking of doing, what I hope will happen, 
is that I'll have this second volume, which I'm calling, the, which I'm calling Places, the names of the places. And um, I'm hoping maybe uh, to republish the names in uh, conjunction with the places. So we'll have one volume of uh, two parts, the names and the places. The chapter on which I'm working at the present is centered on Santa Barbara, California. And it happens that when I uh, finished my graduate work at Stanford and I was ready to take a teaching post, I, I, uh, I managed to land a, a, a position at the University of California at Santa Barbara. This was in 1963. And so I went there, and I spent the next uh, six or seven years, and then I transferred to Berkeley, and then um, uh, back to Stanford, where I'd done my graduate work. So I was 20 years in exile in California. And, but Santa Barbara made a great impression upon me. I, I don't know how many of you know it, but it's a beautiful city, which, and it has uh, the best of both worlds, the mountains and the sea. And it's a really a California city. It's the, it is a city of the uh, missions and the haciendas. It's a beautiful place. So I want to read you just a couple of things from that chapter. <clears throat> the coast of California is a rugged trace of splendor. The morning infuses lightning in the perpetual surf that pounds and vibrates on the rock shelves at Bodega Bay, Monterey, and Big Sur. In the late afternoon, the embers of the sun touch fire to the shivering sea, and there are purple shadows on the cliffs and a vast red and gold threshold on the far apron of the Orient. The Pacific Ocean is an infinite plain of wonder. To behold it from these precincts, and for the first time, is to discover something of the earth that cannot be discovered again. It is once upon a time. And I'm going to skip around here. <clears throat> Gay, who was uh, my wife at the time, had presented me with the first of our three daughters while we were at Stanford. We named her Kale Scott. Kale was uh, a name that came right out of the blue. I thought I had invented it. But I have since learned that it is a Celtic name meaning slender. She was a beautiful and healthy baby and would, share, and would uh, stand to teach me many things. We found a modest, furnished house uh, to rent on the mesa, um, a rise uh, on the edge of the city overlooking the ocean. There was a small glassed-in addition to the house where I could work in comfort and privacy. We settled in. Beside the front door, there was an enormous rose bush with great pink blossoms in every season. In our first winter there, my mother came to visit and declared that it was immoral for roses to bloom in January. <laughs> I bought a dog, a beagle, and named it Henry Sainday. I was becoming a writer. For four years, I had written and studied poetry at Stanford. I had been exposed to the best poems in the English language, and I had sharpened my critical senses as far as I was able. I had written a few, uh, I had written a fair number of poems, a few that I still count among my best, more than that were far less than my best. By the time I graduated, I had grown tired of writing poetry. I felt that I had backed myself into a corner. I was champing at the bit. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a disjuncture here in the text, so I'm going to skip over here to something else. I'm sorry. My landsman's mind hovered over the sea. In view of it, or close to it, or upon it, I thought of the things I had read about it, passages that were strange and alluring to me, the Anglo-Saxon seafarer in view of the storm-thrashed cliffs, the icy feathers of the tern, the screaming eagle, its wings trailing foam, the old man Santiago 
seeing the Portuguese man of war among the pot, among the uh, patches of sargasso weed, or from the depths or from the deck of the Pequod, a great great pod of whales, and the eyes of the mothers and their newborns gazing up and beyond the crew, as I as if fixed on something beyond human discernment. Such wonders were delicious to me, and I pondered them with an almost religious intensity. And now, on the morning beach, I walked dreaming. Henry Sane Day had got far ahead of me, indeed out of sight in the fog. In a moment, I heard him barking excitedly with a, with a note of concern that made me quicken my pace. When I caught up with him, I saw something so striking as to be beyond my imagination. There, barely removed from the surf, was an octopus. Years later, when I had assimilated that stark encounter as I could, I wrote about it in an essay. And now I quote from that essay. The tide was out and there were pools in the sand. Then I saw something in one of the pools under a large piece of driftwood. It was an octopus, whole and motionless, only partly submerged, and it seemed to be dead. It filled me with curiosity, for I had never seen such an unlikely creature before. I stood over it and studied it for a long time, and it did not move, and I wondered if it were dead. It was supple and stark in the water, the color of bone, and I was afraid to touch it. After a while, I got a stout piece of driftwood and, and uh, probed at it. Suddenly it blushed pink and blue and violet, and it began to writhe about. That stiff reaction, total and grotesque, alarmed me, for everything about it seemed to describe some profound agony. It took, off, it took hold of the driftwood and clung to it. I carried it away to the surf and laid it down. I supposed that it would go off at once into the depths, but no, it settled again and lay still. I like to think that it might have been dealing with me that in its alien ocean mind, it was struggling to take my presence into account, that I had touched its deep essential life and it, uh, would, never be the, it would never lose the impression that I had made upon it. It was still there when I came away and it had not moved except that it rocked very slightly to and fro in the water. And now I wonder, what does it mean that after these years, I should speak of the octopus. It may be that I saved its life, but I know very little about the life of an octopus, and I shall not presume to say what salvation is worth to either of us. Only just now, as a strange loneliness, it occurs to me that this creature has, for some years now, been of some small consequence in the life of my mind. And I wonder, I wonder if in the dark night of the sea, there, deep within its own sphere of instinct, the octopus dreams of me. There are things in the world to be seen once and for the first time, never again to be seen or to be seen in the same way. They are unique in our experience. They define some essential part of our being. I saw the octopus then and there, and consequently, I am who I am. Isn't that wonderful? Have you ever seen an octopus? <laughs> There's one more part of it, the last part of the, uh, the last part of what I've written that I want to read to you if I can find it here.
There were the breath of the sea, the fragrance of flowers, birdsong. There was Kale's laughter and baby talk and the playful grumbling of Henry Sane Day. There was nothing to impede my steady and peaceful drift through time. But then, in a moment, there was an intervention. In some connection I could not yet know, my mind swung slowly like a pendulum out of time. It happened often enough. From childhood I had imagined again and again that I was transported from one existence to another. Backwards in time, there was an ancestral figure, perhaps Bamadete, my grandfather, the grandfather I never knew, or Paul Haw, the man who gave me my Indian name. And sometimes the presence was a woman, perhaps my great-great-grandmother, <coughs> Kiedem Kia, whose hands I had once touched as a small child. Or it was that nameless elder who is for me the primordial grandfather, whose faltering steps led northward to the hollow log. And this is a reference to the Kiowa origin myth in which they say that the Kiowas came into the world through a hollow log, the place of origin. I did not know who it was, but we were in good familial reun reunion, relation. He or she was a blood relative to whom I belonged and who belonged to me. The figure was indistinct as though transparent, but seemed not unnatural to me. It spoke softly, but neither did it seem strange to me that I could not understand what it was saying. It seemed prophetic to tell me of something that was going to happen, something that would have meaning for me. I returned to the present, and I was standing at the living room window, having come into the house from my patio office. I think I was holding a cup of coffee. I looked out. There in a corner of the window was the prolific rose bush, its big blossoms heavy and gleaming in the sun. The car rolled into the driveway and stopped. Gay, had, Gay sat behind the wheel. Even in shadow, her face was transfixed. She sat very still. I waited for her to get out of the car, but she made no move. She was staring gravely into space. At first, I was more curious than alarmed. But after several moments, I became concerned. I went out to the car. She looked up at me and said, the president has been shot. And that's where I am in that uh, narrative so far. But the, the 60s in uh, California were unbelievable, as you, you know, I think it was the most intense decade of the century. And when you stop to think about everything that happened during that period, and I was there, um, you know, the Bay of Pigs and the civil rights movement and uh, the assassinations and uh, so on, and we, the ascent of man to the moon and so on. It was an incredible time. So it's fun to write about it and uh, also very challenging. Well, uh, I am a poet a poet who has been so disrespectful as to write some prose. Um, but I, I, uh, I, I, uh, I write because I must. I write uh, in order to inspire and be inspired. I write to fix the struggling mind to the Pacific page, uh, pastoral page. I, I write um, uh, for the sake of writing. And so I would like to read you a poem or two. This one is uh, entitled Hold Me to the Night. And it's a song, really. I'm not a songwriter, but I ventured to write this as a kind of blues song. Hold me to the night. The whispers are softly there in the rain. I hear them now. They come to me in longing. They are the refrains of silence. Hold me to the night. 
Will morning come with sorrow on the edge of taking leave? Has the heart begun to die? Has the constant, in the constant simmer of time, hold me to the night? Be the tender touch of pain. Let me behold at midnight what is sundered in the noon. Bequeath surrender to my brain. Hold me to the night. And when the whispers too are lost and love lingers in the rain, do not say goodbye. But go, tell me not what might have been, but hold me to the night. This one, this is another poem, and it is entitled The Essence of Belonging, and it is uh, dedicated to Kathleen, who is in the audience. <clears throat> Consider the shiver of the mirrored moon. You appear in the shredded light, a figure fixed in approach, suspended. Like Nolde's Sternenwandler, you stand mysterious among the stars. You persist, and a crystal wind braids your definition. Along a cleavage in space, the day becomes, and you conspire in the invention of belonging, radiant, jealously imagined, estranged from time. And to the crowded hesitation, or to the crowded habitation of the mind, you bring a solitude, a mere and sensual silence in which the essence of belonging belongs. A benign self-portrait. A mirror will suffice, no doubt. The high furrowed forehead, the heavy lidded Asian eyes, the long lobed Indian ears, brown skin beginning to spot, of an age to bore and be bored. I turn away, knowing too well my face, my expression for all seasons, my half smile. Birds flit about the feeder, the dog days wane, and I observe the jitters of leaves and the pallor of the ice blue beyond. I read to find inspiration. I write to restore candor to the mind. There are raindrops on the window, and a peregrine wind gusts on the grass. I think of my old red flannel shirt, the one I threw away in July. I would like to pat the warm belly of a beagle or the hand of a handsome woman. I look ahead to cheese and wine and a bit of Bach, perhaps, or Schumann on the bow of Yo-Yo Ma. I see the mountains as I saw them when my heart was young. But were they not a deeper blue, shimmering under the fluency of skies, radiant with crystal light? Across the way, the yellow land lies out, and standing stones form distant islands on the field of time. There is a stillness on this perfect world, and I am content to settle in its hold. I turn inward to a wall of books. They are old friends, even those that have dislodged my dreams. One by one, they have shaped the thing I am. These are the days that swarm into the shadows of legend. I ponder, and when the image on the glass is refracted into the prisms of the past, I shall remember. My parents speaking softly in a warm, familiar room, and I bend to redeem an errant, broken doll. My little daughter, her eyes brimming with love, beholds the ember of my soul. There is the rattle of a teacup, and at the window and among the vines, the whir of a hummingbird's wings. In the blue evening, in another room, there is the faint laughter of ghosts. And in a tarnished silver frame, the likeness of a boy 
who bears my name. I like that uh, laughter of ghosts. It's appropriate, isn't it? Mm. Here's a poem entitled The Snow Mare. In my dream, a blue mare loping, pewter on a porcelain plain, away. There are bursts of soft commotion where her hooves drive in the drifts, and as dusk ebbs on the plain of night, she shears the web of winter, and in the far blind side, she is no more. I behold nothing wherein the mare dissolves in memory beyond the burden of being. I have a friend who says that's my best poem, but he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Who's I would not mind reading it again. All right. <laughs> the Snow Mare. In my dream, a blue mare loping, pewter on a porcelain field away, there are bursts of soft commotion where her hooves drive in the drifts, and as dusk ebbs on the plain of night, she shears the web of winter, and on the far blind side she is no more. I behold nothing wherein the mare dissolves in memory beyond the burden of being. I will not read it again. <laughs> this is one of my favorite poems. I, I don't suppose a poet should admit that he has a favorite, but... But this one I have always, um, I think it's because it uh, uh, is, is also a kind of self-portrait. Because I am a bear. I could tell you that, about that at another, another time, but I, uh, it's called To an Aged Bear. Hold hard this infirmity. It defines you. You are old. Now fix yourself in summer in thickets of ripe berries and venture towards the ridge where you were born. Await there the setting sun. Be alive to that old conflagration one more time. Mortality is your shadow and your shade. Translate yourself to spirit. Be present on your journey. Keep to the trees and waters be the singing of the soil. My father was a full-blood Kiowa, and he was fluent in the Kiowa language. I have never learned that language, I, I say with regret. Um, <clears throat> but he told me something uh, once upon a time that has, has uh, found a, a, a permanent place in my memory, and uh, I wrote a poem about it. But let me tell you what he told me. He said that when I was a boy, he, when he was a boy of about eight or 10 years old, um, he said there was an old man who used to come to visit, come to my grandparents' house to visit. This old man's name was Dragonfly, Koi Kamhodl. And he would come in the proper way of a Kiowa visit, and he would stay for days. And my father was intrigued by this man because he was made of leather, and, and he wore long braids, and he rode on horseback. He came on horseback. And um, finally, my father came to know a little bit about him, and uh, so when Dragonfly would come to the house, before daylight, my father would get up and he would go outside secretly and he would hide behind a corner of the house and he would wait because he knew what was coming. And sure enough, 
After a time, Dragonfly came out of the house and he had painted his face and he was wearing regalia, feathers. And he would go out on the east side of the house, Dragonfly, and he would stand on a little knoll. I have stood on that knoll myself. And he would raise his arms and he would pray aloud to the rising sun. He would pray the sun out of the ground. And my father was greatly impressed and afraid by this, this activity, this image. And I have had that image myself. You know, I, I, I can see Dragonfly. I imagine that I can see Dragonfly in the way that my father saw him. And I wrote this uh, poem about Dragonfly to the sun. Great one, great giver of life and well-being, I lift my old arms in bold entreaty. Rise and flood the land with light. Rise and touch the faces of your people. I entreat you, give us one more day and one more, and at last one more. I lift my old arms in bold entreaty. Great one, with respect I have breathed a smoke. I have wreathed my words in wisps of smoke. So it is that they are made clean and strong. With respect I have painted my face. From my face come words of sacred color. So it is they are made strong and beautiful. I lift my old arms in bold entreaty. Great one, on the mountain you dance in whispering waters. In the bear's tracks you pierce the darkness and you splinter among the herbs, among the limbs of pines. The deer and the badger trace the arc of your path. The prairie grasses tremble in your presence. And now in the dawn appearing, I summon you. I lift my old arms in bold entreaty. I can see him now. Well, I think I'm going to end with that and ask if you have any questions. Maybe take a little, just a little break so you can, you can phrase brilliant questions. 